be concluding our series principles from the parables that we've done over the summer. It's been a, a cool opportunity to kind of, kind of do something different, still expositional studies, but from different portions, taking principles that we can apply to our lives. And tonight, if you guys recall, our last section, we had three sections, was having to do general principles for relationship. And we're going to be finishing off this general principles about relationship by studying Matthew 18, 21 through 35. And the study is entitled, The Discipline of Forgiveness. So let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for this time together tonight that you have uh, ordained, Lord. We know that we're not here to gather simply because a group of men or women uh, made up a meeting, but Lord God, we're fulfilling your command to, to gather You describe us, Lord God, as a temple, as a body, as a family. And Jesus, we know that what that tells us is that we're all part of one entity, though being diverse and different, and we play a different function, Lord. But I pray tonight that we could just be unified, Lord, that you would soften our hearts in preparation for your word, Lord, and that you'd buffet the enemy from trying to distract or disrupt. And we know, Lord, that Uh, Many of us have been under spiritual attack lately, Lord God. At any given time, the spiritual war is intense. And so we ask in the name of Jesus that you'd push out all um, demonic activity or um, influence. And Lord God, help us fix our eyes upon you to really receive the message, Lord God, that's able to transform us, Lord God. The, The living word, Lord. So lead us into truth and may we glorify you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 18. As I said, we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35, and the title is The Discipline of Forgiveness. Now, from time to time, um, me being married, for special events that happen in, in my life or my wife's life, from time to time, I actually buy her flowers. Men, do you do that out there? Do any men buy, or women buy their, their men flowers? I, I would be down with that. I would, I would, that would be cool. So, cat, if you're out there somewhere... But from time to time, you know, I want to show her that I love her. And so I I buy a a nice bouquet of flowers, you know, and I go to the store. I try not to go to the supermarket too much because usually they don't have the best ones, but maybe go like Peoples or something like that and look for a nice bouquet where the flowers are fresh and not wilty, um, where they, they look beautiful, the arrangement is put together well, and bring it home for her, something that will really just... Show her that I appreciate her, that I thought about her, that I think she's beautiful inside and outside. But there was this one time that I wanted to go buy her flowers because there was a special event going on in our lives. I forget exactly what it was. And I bought them and I took the time, but I neglected to remember that the next day we were actually going out of town. And so after that, I felt like, wow, this is a waste. You know, I didn't earn many points because she didn't get to look at them for very long. So I felt bad about that. But we went out of town and we obviously eventually came back home. The flowers were there, but they looked very different than when I first bought them. Um, instead of being full of color and, and you know, uh, standing up firm and uh, fresh, they were wilty and drooping and dead and there were petals all over the table where we had left them. In other words, they had died. They did what, f- what cut flowers do. That beautiful bouquet that I picked out for Catherine was not so beautiful, and it stunk. You know, flowers stink when they're out too long. And what was once beautiful became something that was kind of dead and and dry and not something that we wanted in our house. And the thing is this. It's not that just, just plants that wither and die when they're not taken care of. People, too, can experience this same phenomenon A joyous, loving, and happy person can become a cynical, angry, and bitter person if they harbor unforgivingness. And that's going to be our topic tonight. The topic of forgiveness and the lack thereof. And I really want to, as we enter into this text together, we need to understand that this is such an important topic. And I believe, I've seen it time and time again, you know, in battle, um, it's oftentimes not the battle that, that hardens us, but what we process in the midst of the battle. And it's the same thing in the Christian life or in flowers or whatever we want to talk about. You know, it, it's not the difficulties that change who we are. It's how we uh, 
approach, how we deal, how we process. And so what I'm talking about here tonight in the idea of forgiveness is that someone who was once joyous, loving, vibrant, alive can turn into someone who's very dead. And I think the principal way that that happens is, is when they're not willing to forgive. And that's, that's with God, number one. You know, and sometimes we don't even know it, by the way. We have to enter the conversation in that. Sometimes we don't even know that we're harboring an, kind of an unforgiving attitude. But it's first to God, it's second to others, people that we're close to. But I've, I've seen so many people go from that point to just, just, just lacking motivation and being dead and being dried up and being cynical and being judgmental. And, and they, they question themselves in their mind and say, how did I get to this place? I've become a person that I don't want to be. And I would say tonight that the number one reason is because you chose not to forgive when you needed to. And as we study this passage tonight, we're going to talk about the importance of forgiveness in relation to three people. Kind of the, the, the relational aspect between God and us in forgiveness, how he forgives us, namely. About um, the idea of forgiving others and then also the effects that unforgivingness has on ourselves. Not talking about forgiving ourselves, but there's a great damage that is wrought inside of our heart when we choose not to forgive other people. And most of the time, the damage that is done when we walk in unforgivingness is mostly on us. And we have to know that tonight. So Matthew 18, let's read verses 21 through 22 together. We're going to set the scene for our parable tonight. And it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So we're not going to walk into the parable yet, but we're going to set this scene so we know kind of where we're going and where we're coming from. Now, the context of this parable, I think, is, is very important, but more, more than being important, it's very interesting. And what I want to talk about are the two lessons that are sandwiching this parable about forgiveness tonight. Or in other words, what did Jesus speak about before this and what is he going to speak about after this? And it's very telling and very interesting because before this parable, Jesus is talking about what we're to do when someone sins against us. You know, the very famous passage of Matthew chapter 18 of, of Jesus says, when your brother sins against you, this is what you're supposed to do. So it, it starts off first with that, maybe some sort of confrontation that you had. And then Jesus goes into talking about forgiveness. But following this teaching on forgiveness, you know what Jesus teaches about? He teaches about divorce. And I find that so interesting because in the sandwich between the idea of confrontation and division is the idea of forgiveness. And I don't think that was some like, um, you know, something that just happened out of chance. I think the Lord is trying to teach us tonight that in the midst of confrontation, it, it can be a good thing and, and difficulty in marriage can lead to healing. But what has to be kind of the, the catch word throughout everything we do in regards to relationship with other people is forgiveness. If we're unwilling to walk through these seasons in forgiveness, then they're never going to work out the way that God wanted them to work out. And so that's our context tonight. The reality is, is in the church, in the relational aspect, we will have confrontation with other people. In marriage, we will have confrontation with, other, with, our, with our spouse. In the, job, in the workplace, it's not a matter of if, but when. And if we're not learning to be a forgiving people, then the result of that confrontation will not be for good, but for evil. And it won't be for, for health, but for pain. And it won't grow us, but it will hinder us. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. Also in the context, we see that Peter asks a question. And the reason that Peter asked this question is because Jesus was teaching about confrontation. So he said, Jesus, how, often should, how many times should we forgive our brother when they sin against us doing the same thing? And this is one of those, obviously, rhetorical questions. Or, you know, if you've ever been in a classroom, that person who asks questions just because they want to hear themselves speak. Because we know this because he didn't give time for Jesus to answer. He wasn't really wondering. He, he thought he knew the answer, and he thought he knew his, that his answer was awesome, and he wanted to show his awesomeness. Now, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I want to show my awesomeness. But, you know, the thing that happened with Peter happens with me. I say something stupid. And then rather than being shown awesome, you're shown stupid. Anyone relate to that? You're like, I should have just 
Should have just shut my mouth. So he says, how, Lord, how often should we forgive our brother when he sins against us? Seven times. Now, obviously, this would have sounded very spiritual. It's the number of perfection. But also the rabbis taught that, that three times was what was holy. So there was even a teaching, which is, you know, shows the level of the legalism of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that they said, hey, if you, if you forgive someone three times, you're good. The fourth time, you don't need to worry about it. And we know Jesus' response was, Peter, I tell you, not seven, but 70 times seven. And we know that what Jesus was saying is an unlimited amount of times. Now, the, I think these are things that we all know, but we want to set the scene. And because I think this, this idea of forgiveness is so important, because forgiveness is more than just saying, I forgive you, or I'm sorry, Jesus is going to go into a parable to elucidate some truths, some difficulties about the nature of forgiveness between us and God and us and one another. And that's so important to, to know tonight, that forgiveness, it's a discipline. It's a process oftentimes. It's a choice. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's more than just saying, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. That can be a part of it in the English vernacular, but it has to do with change. It has to do with, with changing your, your direction to ask for forgiveness, to repent. And then on the other side of the coin, when someone actually does change their direction and changes their actions, when we forgive someone, it has much more to do with just saying, I forgive you, right? And then trying not to think about it. It's a whole process. It's a, it's a discipline. It's a choice. It's something that we oftentimes have to engage with, uh, with resolve, forgiveness is. Forgiveness is, is seldom one of those things that we just kind of let happen. Has anyone ever like walked through a season of forgiveness by just been like, let's just see what happens. When we see what happens, oftentimes we harbor bitterness. So it's a discipline, it's a process, it's a choice, it's a work of the Holy Spirit, and therefore Jesus is going to elucidate the nature of it. So he goes on to, let's read verses 23 through 27 and talk about this parable. And it says in verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave the debt. I'm going to stop there for now. We got another half of our parable, but let's talk about this first half. And as I read this parable, I can't help but, but really see Christ's work in this description. Can't help but see what Christ has done for us. And we're going to talk about the certain aspects in a second. But the situation basically that Jesus is painting is this. In this story, we have this king or we have this master. And one day he sits down and he says, you know what, I need to settle accounts, right? It's, it's tax season. It's time to reconcile the books. It's time to make sure that every, all my debts are paid and all those who have debts to me also pay, right? So he's getting his, his financial house in order. And so he begins to call his servants to him and he says, okay, you owe me this, pay. You owe me this, pay. Or maybe, hey, you, you're paid up. You're good to go. And one of his servants, he calls in one of his servants who had borrowed money from him and he reminds him of a debt that he has and it was a great debt. And in the text it says that the debt was um, 10,000 talents, which to us means nothing, but in the modern day it would be about 12 million to 1 billion dollars depending on, so in other words, what? A debt that was unpayable, something that he couldn't pay. And so because this servant could not pay his debt, his only, the only option was for him to be sold, him and his family and all of his stuff. Because in, in first century, when slavery was not only legal, but something looked upon favorably by some people, that's what you would do. You couldn't pay, you'd be sold into, you'd be sold and you'd work it off. And when you think about it, this may sound like a crazy thing, but that's not really that bad of a system, right? Having people be accountable for what they, what they spend and what they do. They were sold into debt. You can't pay, 
you have to pay somehow. So that was his only option. But at the moment when the master says, basically, I'm going to sell you, I'm going to sell your family, and I'm going to sell your stuff, and you're going to be a slave until you can pay back the unpayable debt, which it would have been never. The servant pleads with the master, asking that he would give him more time. Now, the master knows he can't pay the debt, so the master doesn't say, well, okay, in that case, take some more time and try to pay it. He knew it was a debt that was unpayable, and so, rather, the master being filled with compassion, he forgave the debt. This is an awesome story. This is a story of grace and mercy, of withholding the judgment that the man deserved, and not only withholding judgment, but giving him the gift of a free and clean slate. It's a mirror of our picture of salvation, isn't it? We know that. We know that God has forgiven us. And so let's talk about the principles. Again, first we're going to talk about how God forgives us. The way God does things is always our example. Anytime we want to know how to walk through a certain season of life, we ask, how did God do it? How does God do it? How does Jesus do it? So many times we're grasping at imperfect human approaches to difficult problems. We, we look at the family and we talk about how can we fix our family problems. Well, number one is to get back in God's model. We talk about forgiveness. How can we enter a season of healing? It's follow God's model. We talk about evangelism. We talk about healing. We talk about all these things. We have to be willing, number one, to submit to God's model if we want God's blessing. And as Christians, I think we've missed the bus often on that. It's, it, we quickly run to what we think will work rather than what God says will work. The difficult thing is God's process is, is not always what we think it should be. And so let's talk about how God forgives first. Because you know what? The reality tonight is some of us do not know how to forgive. And I know that. And I struggle with forgiveness at time, and I know others that struggle with forgiveness at time. We need to learn how to forgive. We need to seek the Lord on on the process and, and what that takes. And so the principles, number one, that we see in this first portion of text is that, number one, we had a debt that was unpayable, just as the servant We were powerless to change the situation. Nothing we did could free us from the debt. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, the Bible says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we know that the Bible teaches us why why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ made us alive. So, Salvation was never attainable via our power, was it? It was something that God had to do. We had, we had nothing we could do to make it happen. It was all him. And this is an important fact as far as our relationships with one another and with God tonight because we have to know that the first thing we have to understand about forgiveness is that godly forgiveness is most clearly manifest in a situation where the offending party cannot make right. Think about that. Godly forgiveness is most clearly manifest in a situation where the offending party cannot make right. In the situation between God and us, we couldn't make it right. So if God's forgiveness was based upon us doing something good, it never would have happened because our nature is not good. But we take that and we apply the the principles of God's forgiveness to our lives and we understand that if we base our forgiveness first and foremost on someone making the situation right, then forgiveness will be seldom in our lives. If we're waiting, okay, you have to, I'm waiting to forgive for when you make your, it right. Let's use an example. Someone hits my car out in the parking lot that has no money. If I have to wait to forgive them until they can repay me, that may be something that never happens. You see what I'm saying? Or let's, let's imagine that someone steals something from me. They wrong me, but they simply cannot pay it back. If forgiveness is based upon them making it right, I may never walk in forgiveness. Now, to balance this out, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't do that. I'm not saying that if someone wrongs you, you should just say, okay, don't worry about it. There is consequences for our actions. If someone wrongs you and it's in their power to make it right, the Bible says that needs to happen. But the party who's wronged, if I'm waiting upon them to do that, keep waiting. Good thing God didn't wait upon us or we would never be saved. You see, godly forgiveness is most clearly manifest in a situation where the offending party cannot make right. 
When the offending party cannot make right, we still extend forgiveness. That's what God does. So we had a debt that was unpayable, yet God forgave us. Number two, God was moved by compassion. This was the motivation for doing what he did. You know, it wasn't something that we deserved. It was really a mess that we got ourselves into, wasn't it? Sin entering the world. It was mankind's choice. And don't be mistaken that if you were Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you would have made the same choice because our, we all fail. But you see, God's motivation for forgiving us, the catalyst for that was compassion, was love. In, in essence, he couldn't bear to allow the situation to persist. When in our parable, when the master looked upon the servant and he saw the anguish of the servant, he had compassion. That's one of my favorite Greek words in the New Testament. It's splagnizomai. And it literally means to be moved in the intestines, to be gut-wrenched. It means to, be, to kind of have uh, that pain. In English, we would say it was a broken heart. His heart was broken when he saw our situation. Godly forgiveness is secondly, is motivated by compassion and love. And this has to do with understanding what it means to extend it. Think about this. God's, compa or God's forgiveness was motivated by love, compassion. That's why he did it because he understood that, guess what, if he didn't forgive it, or he didn't extend it, excuse me, what would that mean for us? destruction, despair, lack of hope, guilt, shame, sin forever. When he, the thought of God thinking about you in that situation is too much for him to not do anything. Think about that. And so secondly, godly forgiveness is motivated by compassion and love, meaning that when we have a, a heart of compassion or love, when we picture that person walking without the forgiveness that they need to continue on, it's too much for us to bear that it forces us to come to grips that we need to do it. Because let's, the reality, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit later, but when we refuse to extend forgiveness to someone else, they can't receive the healing and the closure that they need to move on. And, and you know what? I, I've seen this a lot um, in, in relationship with maybe Christians, husband and wife, whatever the case may be, that apart from forgiveness, there's this thing hanging over them. There's this kind of, this, this prison, this, this hardness, this lack of freedom. And it's the same thing in the Christian life. Romans chapter five says, since we've been justified by faith, we now have peace with God. Apart from justification and forgiveness, there's no peace because we know that there's this hole, there's this gap that has not been met and you may think by not forgiving someone, they don't really care, but the reality is, is that they're locked up in a prison waiting for you to release them by extending to them the forgiveness that they need. One of the reasons we should forgive is because our hearts are soft enough to not be willing to someone else, someone else to live in that place of, of unforgiveness. That's why God did what he did, because he wasn't willing, no matter what it took, he wasn't willing to allow us to persist in an unforgiven nature. And that's what we were before Christ, weren't we? That's, that's the main thing that separates Christians from non-Christians, is we've been forgiven. We still make mistakes, we still mess up, we still do bad things, but we've been forgiven. And therefore, we can have peace, and peace is a product, always a product of forgiveness, so we had a debt that was unpayable. God was motivated by compassion. And thirdly, we see that God completely erased the debt. Now it's interesting, I think. Notice he didn't like force the servant to even pay anything. Now if it were you or I, you would probably want to still get something out of that servant, wouldn't you? You'd say, okay, I know you can never pay $12 million to $1 billion unless you know something that I don't know or you win the lottery tomorrow. And so therefore, I'm gonna make your debt more manageable. Ooh, this should send chills down your spine because this should remind you of something that we negatively do on a routinely basis. Okay, I know you can't pay your debt fully, but how about just a little part? 
How about just a little pain? How about just a little shunning? How about just a one night sleeping in the other room? You're going to pay in some way, and then I'm going to forgive you. That's not what the master did. The master completely erased the debt. He didn't force the servant to pay a little. He didn't punish him in a different way. He didn't say, okay, you can't pay, but this is what I want you to do. You're going to come to my house every Friday, and you're going to clean the floors with a toothbrush. And therefore, I will get mine because I'll get to laugh at you looking funny. Didn't force the servant to pay. Didn't, force him to pun didn't punish him in a different way. His forgiveness was a complete forgiveness. 100% debt-free like that. Godly forgiveness is a complete forgiveness. And therefore, when we're forgiving as Christ has forgiven... Our forgiveness is a complete forgiveness. Now, does this mean that all of a sudden it's just erased from your memory? No, we talked about forgiveness as a process, but it's be something we should be working for, a complete forgiveness. And specifically in the marriage situation, I want to hit on that tonight. I've seen so many times, I've experienced and I've been a part of it. So I'm not going to say that all oh, you down there, the lowlings need to listen. Oftentimes what we do is we say we'll forgive, but the intention of the heart is we will forgive, but you will pay. And you're going to pay by whatever means we think are necessary. You know, you're going to be at my, uh, you know, you're going to have to do certain things for a while or you're going to have to do this or you're going to have to do that. But if we're truly forgiving, it's a race like that and there's no lingering. And women, I need to talk to you tonight because I love you and my wife is the most precious person in my life. But this is a problem that you have. You say you forgive, but you bring it back up. And I'm not, I'm not saying in the nagging way, I'm saying in the realistic way. We, us men have other problems, but if you bring it back up, you have not forgiven. Now, you can bring it back up in a way that says, hey, you know, maybe I'm struggling with this. I think that's an okay thing. It doesn't mean that you have to be silent and never think about it again because God's made you in a certain way. But if you, if you say, you know what? I'm just still really mad at you for this thing that you did in 1986. You haven't forgiven. Now, will you struggle with it? You, I think you probably will, you know? And we all struggle with that. Remember back in the day when so-and-so did this to me? But if you're still struggling, if it's still taking control of you and, it, and it's making you angry and frustrated and emotional, com forgiveness hasn't been complete. It means that the situation's done. We may struggle with it, but the situation's done. Now, men, you need to be understanding of how God has made your wife that it's very, very, very difficult for them to just say it's done. And that's okay because that's how God made them. And so we shouldn't be saying, you know what, well, that's what, I, that's what happened back in the day. We should say, I'm so sorry that you're still struggling with that. Now, it doesn't make it right for the wife, but it makes it doubly wrong for the husband to say, you always bring up my past, woman. That's not the right attitude to have. God has made us differently. But whether you're a man or you're a woman, you're a father or mother or a child, when we bring things back up, that means that we haven't quite forgiven yet. And with God too. We may say, hey God, you know what? I'm still kind of bitter about, you know, you allowing my family to fall apart or you're allowing this or you're allowing that. And God doesn't ask for our forgiveness. We don't need to forgive God. But when we harbor bitterness against things that he's done, we need to reconcile those. So truly, God's truly forgiveness is he erases the debt 100%. There's no paying for it. There's no, you know, he didn't call the servant back up a couple of years later and say, hey, um, I was just thinking, remember that debt that you owed me? I was just thinking if I could get a quick five, you know, and you know people hang it over your head? Have you ever had someone that hangs it over your head? You're like, I'm sorry. I already said I was sorry. Obviously, you did not forgive me. That is, you know, my frustration coming out. <laughs> And we feel like that sometimes, right? This is the thing, though, honestly and, and realistically. God's forgiveness is a complete forgiveness. And if we want to walk like God, we have to seek that. It may be difficult. It may be tough. It may take time. But husbands and wives, one of the worst things you can do is holding those things over that happened in the past and bringing them into the present. It's so painful, it's so, it's so hurtful. It's so destructive. Now, you may do, be doing that for one or two reasons. You may still be bitter or you may have never communicated about it. Whatever the case may be, it's never, it's never helpful 
to bring back thing, uh, things in the past that were supposed to be forgiven. So be communicative. Seek to be a complete forgiver as God is a complete forgiver. And I've heard stories, let's be honest with ourselves, and I just heard a story the other day where a couple, one was like 90 years old and the other was like 92 and they've been married for like 50 years. They got a divorce. And you could just ask, why would you even, how would you have any, even the energy to do that at that age? No offense. But I mean, I can't imagine having the energy to do that at my age. I'm 27. But when you're 92, like I would just think, hey, hold on for a couple more years, right? I'm just saying. And who knows, maybe they'll live a lot longer. But no, but no this, is, this, is, this shows us the power that unforgiveness and bitterness can, hold, can have in us, that there's just so much anger and frustration and unforgivingness that one day it's just, that's it. It doesn't matter if you're 92 or 27, it's it, it's done. Okay, let's go on to verses 28 through 35. Continue on in our story tonight. It says, but the servant, the one that was just forgiven, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So pretty kind of blunt and, and difficult and clear tag that Jesus adds to the end of his parable. And he says, you know, basically, this is good, what's going to happen to people who do not forgive. But first we talked about how God forgives us. That's our model. And some really good principles, I think, there. Just to remind you that God, we had a debt that was unpayable. And God forgive, forgave us when we couldn't make it right. God's forgiveness was motivated by compassion. His forgiveness was a complete forgiveness. But now let's go on to talk about this second section and maybe some principles that have to do with us forgiving one another and vice versa. So the second portion of our story is a little bit of a di different situation, but some similarities. We see that the servant who was forgiven, right, he went to one of his fellow servants. So on the same level, someone, a brother who had owed him some money. Now, the question is, what is the comparison and the ratio uh, of how much the first servant owed his master and how much the second er er servant owed his friend? Well, in the text, it speaks of denarii, a hundred denarii, and we know that one denarii was about one day's wage. So he owed his fellow servant or his brother about a hundred days wages. So if you think about kind of, you know, a third of a year in essence, you know, if you make $60,000 a year, it's $20,000. Okay, some of us may, are probably in more debt than that today if we have houses, right? So you have more debt than that. But it was about 100 days wages. And in comparison, it was one six hundred thousandth of what the first servant owed his master. That's quite a difference. And so the first servant asked the second servant for payment. Obviously, the second servant couldn't pay as we read. And he basically said the same thing that the first servant said, give me more time. But rather than acting like his master had acted, the, the first servant says to the second servant, you know what? No, you're going to prison. You're going to be a slave until you can pay the debt. He was very violent with him. He grabbed him by the neck. But nevertheless, when his fellow servants heard of the situation of what had happened in light of the master's forgiveness, they reported to the master. And the master held the first servant accountable and said, how can you do this in light of what I've done for you? How can you treat a fellow servant so poorly? How can you not extend forgiveness and compassion in light of what I've shown you? And then the master does something that we think is uncharacteristic of our king, but is actually very characteristic. And he said, 
He delivered them to the torturers, the text says, until he could pay the debt. And that's a, that's a heavy thing. It's a, uh, and one aspect tonight, it's a very heavy word tonight because um, we're talking about, we're going to talk about God, we talked about God's forgiveness, about our forgiveness, about how unforgiveness damages us, but the reality of the situation as we understand tonight is that um, God does not extend forgiveness to those who will not forgive. And we'll go on and talk more about that later. But let's talk about some of the principles found in this text. We see first and foremost that others' debt to us is insignificant compared to what we owed God. That's the first thing that we see. The level and the gravity of our sin toward God dwarfs what others have done to us. And in contrast, while our debt was unpayable, others' debt is payable. Now think about this for a second. There, there's a very big difference. Our, the sins that other people treat us with, important they are. They're difficulties of life. We're not downplaying them. Do we blow them out of proportion? Yes, we do. Because our sin on someone else looks a lot worse than our sin on us. See, the, the reality is that when other people wrong us, we've done equally or greater to God all the time. So you may say, let's think about some things, how people wrong us. They may, maybe they gossip about us, they blaspheme us, they slander us, you know, they on and on and on, they're rude to us, they steal from us. All those things we've done to God and greater. So it doesn't take away the fact that when someone wrongs us, it's an, it's an important and a serious thing. But for some reason, we think when someone sinned against us, it's the worst thing in the world. And Jesus is telling you tonight, get some perspective and think about what you've done to me first and foremost. Now again, I don't want you to make you think like, okay, so get over it. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is perspective is important. It's important to understand that what others have done to us, the debt that they owe us via sin, is insignificant and minuscule compared to what we've done to Christ. And therefore, we should have that heart that says, okay, you know what? What I've done to them or what they've done to me, I've done to Jesus. And while I might have deserved it, honestly, Jesus didn't deserve it. And so in that light, you know what? It's not as a big of a deal as I'm making it out to be. Number two, unforgiveness is motivated by pride. Unforgivingness is motivated by pride. In our story, we see the ideas of this, I'm right and they're wrong. They don't deserve it. They didn't ask, whatever the case may be. Why didn't the, the first servant forgive the second servant? Was it because he really needed the money? No, it was, it was all about pride. It was all about position. It was all about saying, you know what? You don't deserve this. And the reality is that the servant probably didn't deserve it. But really, when we are unwilling to extend forgiveness, no one ever f deserves it. Again, if we're waiting on someone to deserve it, then it's probably never going to happen. But unforgivingness has, carries with it the idea of, you know, I'm right, and I'm not going to forgive until you tell me I'm right, or you don't deserve it, or you haven't earned it, or you didn't ask for it. And this brings up an important topic tonight. Where does the idea of forgiveness play in with the aspect of when someone doesn't ask for forgiveness? What if you're saying, you know what? I'll forgive when they ask for forgiveness, that's totally unbiblical. That's totally unbiblical. And the reason that is, is because although a relationship may not be able to be totally healed until they do ask for forgiveness, when you harbor unforgivingness, it's going to only hurt you and it's going to separate you from others and you from God. Now, again, what I'm not saying is that, that if someone hasn't repented, that doesn't mean that the relationship can be made right, but you should still seek to extend for forgiveness because that's what Christ has asked us to do. Our unwillingness to forgive is always motivated by pride. Always motivated by pride. And pride is never okay. In Proverbs 16, 5, it says, everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. Number three in the principles of, of forgiveness with one another Unforgivingness puts that person in prison. As we mentioned earlier, in order to have peace with God and others, it's required that we both repent and receive forgiveness. 
When we choose not to extend forgiveness to others, we trap them in a prison of guilt, which causes people to become self-conscious, untrusting, and closed off. I'm going to elucidate on that for just a second. In our parable, we see that the man, unwilling to forgive, ended up putting the person in prison. But very metaphorically and allegorically, this is true in our lives, that when we do not forgive, we put other people in this prison, especially in the realm of marriage and friendship. Because you can feel that, that, that tension. You can feel that, that thing you know you've not been forgiven, that although you may have asked for forgiveness and you've repented and you've humbled yourself, when someone has not extended, to, extended that to you, the relationship has changed. And personally, I've seen and understood that when you feel that someone is bitter towards you, maybe a wife to a husband or a husband to a wife or a friend, you start to become self-conscious. Now, self-conscious sometimes is kind of a worldly term, but I think it can be a biblical term too. What I mean by self-conscious is you become skittish. You become, um, it's difficult to, to have confidence in what you're doing because you feel as if everything you do is wrong. That's the prison of guilt. You're untrusting. When there's unforgiveness in a relationship, it's hard to have trust. When you know that someone has not forgiven you, and you know, for the most part, it's hard to trust them because you're hurt. Healing can't happen outside of forgiveness. So when, when, when someone, when, okay, you know you've wronged someone and you've blown it bad, and you know it, but they choose not to forgive you, it's hurtful, it's painful. Because there's this thing about with, with us and God and us and one another, is that Guilt is on our shoulders until we repent. When we repent, we can receive forgiveness, and forgiveness frees us of our guilt. It's like this supernatural, awesome thing that gives us peace. And then finally and ultimately, we start to become closed off to the other partner, the other party. Because it's hard to be vulnerable with someone whom you know still finds fault in what you've asked for forgiveness for. And you may have experienced this tonight, and you may be in a place of hurt. And my encouragement to you is seek the Lord, trust the Lord, allow Him to heal you, allow Him to, to minister to your heart. Because living in a situation of unforgivingness can be very painful, can, can hurt you, can change you. And so we have to know on the other side of the coin, the person who needs to do the forgiving, that when you choose not to forgive, you put someone in a, in a spiritual prison, and you limit them. And I've seen a, a relationship where two people have come together, and one was a very unforgiving person, and that person really changed. They start to question what they do. They start to be lacking confidence, to be self-conscious, to be more closed off, to be unwilling to trust, to be unwilling to kind of put yourself out there for fear of being smashed down upon. Number four, unforgivingness is ultimately a sin against God. We may, may not always associate the two, but when we choose not to forgive others, we're not just sinning against them, but God also, because God has called us to forgive. God, God has commanded us to forgive. So, an interesting question to think about as we've talked about the text tonight is we've talked about the model of God's forgiveness. It is, it is pure. It is perfect. When we try to employ it as imperfect people, it doesn't always work out the way we want it to, but strive to hit the mark. We've talked about the relationship with one another, how that uh, your debt to me is, is insignificant compared to my debt to God. That if I do not choose to forgive, it's because I'm walking in pride and, you know, let's be honest, sometimes pride, that pride comes from a place of being hurt. And we put up a prideful wall because we don't want to be hurt. And that's, we understand that, but we need to get past that. We understand that when we choose not to forgive, we put someone else in a prison. And then ultimately, when we choose not to forgive, it's a sin against God. But why not, I want to end tonight by talking about something that's not necessarily in the text, but very much a part of this topic tonight. What happens to us 
when we choose to not to forgive? What happens to the inward man? What happens to the inward person when we choose not to forgive someone else? Number one, going back to the analogy of flowers and plants. Number one, we become detached from the vine. In Matthew 6, 14 through 15, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Think about this, becoming detached from the vine. When flowers are cut to be sold, they immediately begin to die. That's because they do not receive the proper nutrition from the, from the vine, from the plant, from the root. In like manner, when we don't forgive, we begin to die. Because the biblical principle is very clear and it's very much that we will not receive forgiveness if we choose not to forgive. Now, does, does being detached from the vine meaning that we lose our salvation? No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we can't receive proper spiritual nutrition because oftentimes the most important aspect of our spiritual nutrition comes via forgiveness. We sin against God, we need to receive forgiveness. That's kind of the starting point. And so when we're choosing not to forgive, we can't be properly nourished by God, fed by God. And therefore, we're detached from the vine. Number two, we start to wither. Outward signs start to show concerning an inward bitterness, just like a flower, right? It starts off, okay, you're not forgiving, you're detached from the vine, you start to not get the nutri nutrients that you need. It doesn't show up right away, but then it starts to show up on the outside, and you start to wither, you start to die, or in other words, we become cynical, we become judgmental, we become isolated, we become cold. Those are all signs of, of not forgiving. We become cynical, judgmental, isolated, and cold. And then finally, what happens to us when we choose not to forgive? We eventually die. Or in other words, we lose the capacity for relationship. And that's the ultimate price. Now, I'm not saying that if, you, if you're one who chooses not to forgive, that you're going to lose your salvation or you're never going to be able to go to heaven or anything like that. But what I'm saying is your capacity for relationship will be hindered or non-existent with both God and others. And I think we've all known one or two Christians who at one time loved the Lord and walked in, in joy and walked in goodness. And after a while, you started to see a change. And they were distant. And that person who was more positive became more negative. And that, that person who was more, you know, uh, more of an encourager became more of a judger. And they started to become cold. And then ultimately you didn't see them anymore. And they just stay at home. And, and then, then they're the, kind of the type of people who say, I, I am a Christian, but I don't really care for people. That, that's, that's not biblical, guys. There's, there's no way that you can be a Christian in God's will and not care for people. And if you're in that place, it's because you've gotten to, to a place of bitterness. Now, it's a harsh word tonight, and I want to bring it with love. And I want to let us all know and remind us that we all struggle with this place. I'm not up here saying, hey, if, if you're cynical and judgmental, you're in full-blown sin. What I'm saying is, this is a big battle for us. The idea of extending forgiveness, of receiving forgiveness, of repentance... And it all has to do with humility and just saying, you know what? It's not about me. It's about God. It's about others. And so if you're battling with this tonight, if you felt like, you know what? One time I was that vibrant flower and I've become more of a, more of a crispy rose, you know? God wants to change that and he can change it. And we all go through seasons we go through seasons where, you know what, the reality is the pressures of life and the transgressions against us make us frustrated. They do. Husbands and wives, that's, that's kind of a part of marriage, isn't it? You know, that's something we're going to battle with. Asking ourselves, why does this person keep doing this thing that I hate? Or, or why do they keep doing this thing that is against me, that's wrong? Why are they not considerate of what I'm thinking? That's hard. But when you get to that place, the thing is you have to say, you know what, but I need to forgive. I don't, maybe you don't want to forgive, but it's what God's called us to do. It's what's going to preserve our freshness. It's what's going to keep us attached to the vine and in fellowship. 
And you know what? God will change that person through a soft heart of forgiveness. Grace changes people. When someone who's transgressed against you receives forgiveness that they never deserved, that's like, whoa. What, what, are you, what kind of voodoo are you pulling on me, man? That's powerful. And so when we talk about forgiveness, it's a difficult thing. And I would dare say that each one of us tonight have struggled with some form of unforgiveness. I have. I, need, I, I know I need to go home and tell my wife, you know what, I forgive you for, honestly, for some things that I haven't forgiven you for. And I went through a season, let, I just want to be honest tonight. I went through a season, I, w- I felt like I was a lot better at forgiving when I first got married. Anyone else? <laughs> honestly? And I've only been married, married for four years. But you know what? Um, It's easier at the beginning, it becomes harder with time because whether or not sometimes sins add up and hearts become hard. And you know, I think tonight one of the things that the Lord is speaking to me is saying, you know what, Adam, you need to get back to that place where you're forgiving and you're not holding things in and you're not holding things above someone else's head because your debt is far, to me, it was far greater than anyone's debt to you. In light of God's forgiveness, we're called to forgive when we don't, we not only sin against God, but we hurt others, we hurt ourselves, and we damage that capacity for relationship. Here's the principle tonight as we close. When we're wronged, we must choose to forgive, for the pathway of unforgivingness will destroy the possibility of meaningful relationship. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you tonight, and we thank you for what you've done, Lord. And I, I stand here a sinner, Lord. Um, struggling with unforgivingness, Lord. I stand here as a man who, who has transgressed, who is a man who's come to my fellow servant and said, pay me what you owe when you showed compassion on me, Lord. So more than praying for the congregation tonight, Lord, I pray for myself, um, not up here judging, but saying, Lord, I need help with this really bad. And I think that we all do tonight, Lord God. And I want to pray over our flock tonight and and those who are on the live stream, Lord God, and if we've harbored bitterness and unforgiveness, Lord God, help us tonight to let go. Um, If we are a victim of unforgivingness, Lord God, help us understand that you know what? You're bigger than that. And Lord God, um, if we're in a place where we're mad at you, I I pray that you'd show us, you know what? We have no place because everything that you've done is good for us, is beneficial, Lord. So as a body, Calvary Chapel East, as a family, Lord God, help us with forgiveness, will you, Lord God? Will you help us extend it? Will you help us receive it? Will you help us uh, make it a part of our daily life to resolve to forgive, to choose to forgive, to be disciplined in forgiveness? And I pray tonight as we leave, there wouldn't be a, a spirit of heaviness, Lord God, but a spirit of opportunity to saying, you know what? I can change this tonight via the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.